This is a Nightline Friday night special. Hi, Frank. 911, what's the location of your emergency? This is on Mount Hood. We have seven people down. It started out as a climbing expedition that went terribly bad. My assumption at that point was they're all dead. As climbers fall into a crevasse near the summit of Oregon's highest mountain. As soon as I felt my feet go over, I just kind of braced for landing. So I just landed right on my back. And unfortunately, things would get worse. I looked over my left shoulder. Uh, the wind direction changed. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to they're gonna hit the deck. And they, they did. Then we heard Black Hawk down, Black Hawk down. For those who have to risk their lives because they have to. Uh, they know there's an inherent risk involved when you go up to 10,000 feet to pull somebody out of a, a crevasse or off the side of a mountain that's been injured. To save those who risk their lives because they want to. Tonight, rescue. The tragedy on Mount Hood. From ABC News, this is Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Chris Bury. In one way, this story is as familiar as the mountain that dominates the sky near Portland, Oregon. Underestimating Mount Hood has proven deadly on a regular basis. So regular that about 130 people have died there in the last 100 years including a man who tried to snowboard his way down last week and nine people who died on a school outing in May 16 years ago. Among experts, Mount Hood is not considered that difficult to climb. Indeed, 10,000 people do it every year. But every step in the snow runs the risk of nature's capacity to surprise. It's one thing to risk your own life, of course, another to endanger the lives of others. That's what millions of Americans saw so vividly on television last night. A helicopter sent to rescue nine trapped climbers crashed and tumbled down the slope. All six of the crew members were injured, two of them seriously. Of the nine climbers, three are dead. The great irony is they began the climb on a day when conditions at Mount Hood were described as perfect. About the only change we see happening is maybe a few more clouds in the morning, possibly having some of the days be partly sunny rather than mostly sunny, but who's going to complain about that? Like most treks up the south slope of Mount Hood, this one began after midnight when the snow fields are firm. May is prime time for climbers because they assume the weather is most often agreeable. We've been wanting to do this for five years, so when we got up there, we spent the night, and then we got up at 2.30 in the morning and got ready to go climbing. And it was kind of cold, but uh, the, as the day progressed, it was really a beautiful day. Before we, we, we got to an area they call the Saddleback, and we were rested there before we started our ascent to the, the, to the summit, the final 800 feet. It was a uh, clear blue sky. You could look down across the valley, see the clouds. It's just a gorgeous day. Cleve Joyner and his son Cole were among those who set off for the summit. I've never climbed a mountain like Mount Hood. I've rock climbed a little bit, but nothing like that. As we started up, it was the conditions were icy, but uh, you know, we were being cautious and we'd gone through what we were going to do if, if we started to slide and what we we're supposed to do. The south route of Mount Hood is considered the easiest approach. Climbers must register. It's an honor system, but no special training is required. Still, even this approach is what mountain climbers call a technical route to the 11,240 foot summit. Technical climb means that you need um, mountaineering boots, crampons, uh, Gore-Tex, proper clothing, and experience um, in using those, uh, that type of equipment. Most teams do rope up for this climb. Um, steepness is only about 35 degrees, uh, which may not sound that steep. However, if you consider you've got several hundred vertical feet of 35 degrees snow and ice, uh, the consequences of a fall can be serious. And the month of May can play terrible tricks on the mountain. Every climber here knows what happened when a group from the Oregon Episcopal School attempted to reach the summit on May 12, 1986. By mid-afternoon, the climb was halted by an intense storm that brought blinding snow and a wind chill of 50 below. So the climbers dug a snow cave to spend the night. From the snow cave, rescuers pulled out Giles Thompson and Brinton Clark. Their heart rates critically low and their bodies stiff from the cold, but alive. But seven other teenagers and two teachers froze to death 
in the deadliest accident ever at Mount Hood. The Oregon Episcopal School accident still sticks out in the minds of most climbers here at, at Mount Hood. Just due to the age of the climbers and the number of um, fatalities back in 1986, uh, it's just something that people really uh, still consider, uh, they're concerned about. But all of that seemed far away for the climbers who set out yesterday on that cool and clear morning. We got to an area that they call the Berkshroom, and it's a, a large crevasse uh, that you have to negotiate, get around in order to continue. And so Cole's team of three, uh, they started around that, and they were just coming uh, above the, the face of that on the uphill side. We were on the lower, on the downhill side from the crevasse. There was another team of four above them, uh, probably about maybe 100 feet or so, and then another team of two was even further up. One member of that two-man team lost his footing and started a human chain reaction that sent nine climbers tumbling into the crevasse 800 feet below the summit. The lead person broke loose and then they both came down, hit those four, and then hit our three and then they all went into the crevasse. It was very quick. I didn't see the team of two take out the team that was in front of us. I just saw that team, like those two teams sliding towards us and our guy Jeff told us to get out of the way and we tried but uh, one of our guys got hit by him and taken down into the crevasse and that pulled us in. As I went into the crevasse I, I felt myself come hit probably the downhill side of the Berkshire and wall and then I tumbled forward onto a snow slope about 45 degrees and landed on a ledge where there was five other people um, on that ledge and then there was a group of four to my left that were basically wedged down in uh, this three foot wide crack pancaked on top of each other. They all disappeared into the crevasse. We were just kind of in stunned and there, then there was just a shower of ice that came down on us and you know, so we had to you know, put our helmets down and stay on the hillside until that all passed. As soon as I felt my feet go over, I just kind of braced for landing. So I just landed right on my back and slid down. Cleve Joyner had a cell phone, and just before 9 a.m., he called for help. But his battery died, and he had to borrow another hiker's phone to complete the call. In all the confusion, he counted seven trapped climbers instead of nine. What's the location of your emergency? This is on Mount Hood on the south side, about 800 feet from the peak. We have seven people down, possibly four injured. They fell into the crevice. On the south side? South side. Okay. Above the lift. About 800 feet from the top. Can you, can you see them at all or can you... I, I can't see them. I'm down to the crevice. But the report is, we've got a couple of paramedics up here. The report is that I've got seven down in there and I've got four that are injured. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Sprint PCS. All our volunteer rescuers are on call 24-7. I received a page that seven climbers had fallen into a crevasse. Um, as many things like this are, you don't always get accurate information immediately, um, but you get the general gist of the rescue. Well, my first thought was, as I got up, was kind of uh, jubilation that I realized that I was essentially unhurt, that all of my limbs were functioning, um, and my mental status was good. I didn't have a concussion or anything like that. When we tried to move people, their injuries, like, inhibited us from really moving them so we f knew that they had injuries and then there's just a couple of people who weren't there anymore. Cole Joyner's father belonged to the Talaton Fire Rescue Team so did several other climbers. Jeff Pierce who was another one of our guys he was our leader he started making assessments on uh, who was injured down there because he got in with us but he was able to walk around we just started making assessments on who was hurt and how badly 
And when we got there, there was a group of probably about 20 climbers um, up there and about four patients laying on the ground. Um, our initial report was one was DOA, um, two were pretty critical, and the rest were semi-critical. Climbers were coming down and climbers were coming up. They, once they found out what was going on, they immediately uh, went into action, started getting their ropes out and their blankets. An emergency room doctor, Steve Boyer, who took these pictures, had himself been climbing the mountain alone when he heard about the accident and headed to the scene. The first person we decided to bring out was one who was becoming hypothermic. And we uh, leveled out a platform for him in the sun up out of the crevasse and brought him up on a pulley system. Jeff Pierce, the most experienced of the group, climbed deep into the crevasse to assess the wounded. And he identified one of the people, said that his pupils were fixed and dilated, and he was blue. And uh, we said, okay, we're going to have to leave him for dead. Uh, he didn't respond to pain. But he was right on top of uh, another person that he needed to assess, so he had to cut the body loose uh, in order to evaluate the next person. Our patient was pretty seriously injured. He had uh, a broken jaw, I believe he had a broken ankle, and he had some internal injuries. And he was starting to degrade pretty quickly. And we were very concerned that if we didn't get him off the mountain using a helicopter, that he might not make it off that mountain. Well, as I arrived, the first helicopter was coming to uh, raise the first patient into the helicopter. Uh, that actually went very smoothly. Um, standard pickoff, the uh, lower a hoist down to us, we attach the litter, goes up into the helicopter, and then it flies away. Um, so that went fine. They had done two air extractions already, and they were going back for the third critical um, when the accident occurred. Being under one of the H-60 Pavecox is an amazing experience. Uh, they generate 100, 110 mile an hour rotor wash that rains down on you. Anything that isn't tied down is going to be wiped away from the winds. Um, and it picks up all the ice on the slope and blows it into your face, um, sandblasting any exposed skin. We loaded the patient into the litter um, and had just attached uh, the hoist cable to the litter when the helicopter started losing altitude. And then I looked over my left shoulder and I saw that uh, they were losing altitude and it was clear that they were gonna crash. And it was a horrifying scene. A scene recorded in excruciating detail by reporters and photographers from Portland television stations. Uh, so they move forward and then we see the tail dip and you know that that's a problem with this altitude because they're just not that high off the snow and there's not really much wiggle room. And then when the, they uh, spun around and started down the hill, I just had this sickening feeling in my stomach. It was just awful. It was just horrible because you knew that the odds of them pulling this thing out were gonna be very small. My first thoughts were, is this a survivable crash? The helicopter pilot seemed to do a really good job of setting the aircraft down or trying to set it down on the side of the mountain. He lost control of the tail rotor and then the front end of the helicopter, the actual fuel spout sort of touched uh, onto the side of the mountain and it started to roll. When it started to go down, it was totally unexpected and there was a moment of, of disbelief that this could happen on our mountain. And suddenly they were uh, apparently losing uh, power. Uh, the wind direction changed, and I thought, "Oh my gosh, they're going to they're going to hit the deck." And they they did on a probably a 35 to 40 degree slope. It's not terribly steep. I just heard a very large crash, and when I looked up, I saw the helicopter rolling down the hill. The rotor went into. 20 pieces all over the mountain and then the helicopter as we stood there horrified uh, rolled 10 12 times came very close to going into the crater itself there's people being ejected from the helicopter being rolled over and uh, you know at that point I wasn't sure if we we're gonna have fatalities what was going on it was just an absolutely surreal almost an out-of-body experience it was a dreamlike state everything was like slow motion uh, you, you could watch every, every part of the, the aircraft fall apart. Um, people 
exiting the, you know, or being thrown from the aircraft for that matter. It became very quiet. It went from deafening noise with the rotor, uh, rotor wash to dead silent once the aircraft came to, to rest. As soon as it came to a rest, there was still, you know, seconds of silence. Um, before we all kind of went back and realized what happened and jumped back into action. Two paramedics or, or parajumpers were thrown out of the helicopter as it rolled and we could see them sitting higher on the slope and so immediately ran down and so now we had two more injured climbers to get out and, and five injured paramedics. So as a rescuer you're doing your very best to keep track of the aircraft to keep track of the patient and all the other rescuers and make sure that everything's running smoothly. Um, but it's very difficult to do that with all this chaos going on around you. So I dove behind uh, part of the ridge trying to shield myself from any flying debris and uh, was able to watch the helicopter uh, tumble and roll all the way down into the uh, West Crater Rim area. Our game plan changed after that. We had to uh, go from having two regular patients to now having to deal with the flight crew and in essence re-triaging everyone, finding out if the flight crew was more hurt um, than the patients originally and then decide again who needs to be flown or taken off the mountain. The helicopter was hovering roughly 20 feet above us. Uh, so if the helicopter hadn't been able to pull off to the side and land where they did, um, or crash where they did, uh, certainly we could have had much more severe injuries and more injuries with the rescuers directly below the aircraft. The wind changed a little bit and they just lost their lift. And I guess also what happened is uh, in order not to land on the rescue party, he decided to dump it. Well, after the a helicopter came to rest uh, and a few seconds later we realized that our patient was not more than say 100 or 150 feet away from the crash site and he was critically injured so we were debating as to whether we should move him or not. Somehow all six crew members survived the helicopter crash and its topsy-turvy roll down the mountainside. In the end six of the nine climbers were pulled to safety but three of them had to spend last night on the mountain. We had to walk down about about a thousand vertical feet. Cleve Joyner and his son were also able to walk away. I wanted to get Cole off the mountain as well, and so we teamed up, the four of us, put our ropes on, and, and then just descended off the, the mountain. We were exhausted by this point. Our legs were wobbly. Uh, you know, our our. Our minds were pretty shot at this point. I mean, we had just seen a lot that day. Of the rescues I've been on, nothing compares to this even close. At the end of the day, the exhausted rescue teams came off the mountain and relived the whole harrowing experience. Went to the hospital. Went to the hospital, so I mean, I'm mad again. Today in Portland, the accident stirred up debate on who should be responsible for the risk of climbing Mount Hood. Yeah, and these people that do climb, they should be required to post a bond to pay for their rescue. If you can't do that, you've got no business being up there because the taxpayers are getting darn sick and tired of footing the bill for these people. If you're a rescuer, you understand, and that, that goes for Portland Mountain Rescue, that goes for the 304th Rescue Squadron, that goes for American Medical Response. You understand that you're putting yourself in danger when you go up on a mission. There is a level of danger, especially in a situation with a helicopter evacuation. You know that it's a risky maneuver. You're high in altitude. You've got very little wiggle room when you're flying up there. It's something that you just understand the risk and you deal with it. The mountain is a big draw for skiers, hikers, and climbers, but the risk for climbers is greatest. On average, at least one dies on Mount Hood every year. The mountain is manned by both volunteer and paid rescue teams, and Oregon is among the states that levies fines, up to $500 on careless climbers whose own mistakes lead to expensive rescues. When you see somebody that does something um, just, you know, plain reckless, climbing Mount Hood in tennis shoes and a bowie knife, things like that, um, you know, and you have to go risk your life to save them, you know, yeah, you wish that they used better judgment. Anytime there's a risk, there's going to be injury, and. Uh you know, those services are available, which is really, in my mind, no different than a, a car accident or anything like that. It's, 
you, you have the emergency people there. They're there for a reason. And, and when you need them, you, you utilize them. Cleve Joyner also realizes how close his own family came to disaster. For me, uh, probably the, the, the most significant thing I'm taking away from this is just the fact that, you know, I mean, this guy next to me is just, I think the world out of him, and, and I almost lost him. I thought he was gone, and, uh, you know, just realizing how important it is to, to uh, how important family is and how, you know, that at any moment, you know, if you don't take advantage of the time while they're here, at any moment they could be gone. And, you know, so it was... I'm still wrestling with a lot of that. This morning, as the community confronted the worst climbing accident here since the 1986 Episcopal School catastrophe, another team headed up the mountain to the accident site. I think the lesson here is uh, not to take any mountain for granted. No one should think that they can just come out on one summer day and climb the mountain and that's it. There's always a level of danger. Now, the team was off to recover the last body. This time, the mountain had taken three more lives. I'll be back in a moment. If you missed a Nightline broadcast, or you want to watch when you want, log on to nightlineondemand.com. Sponsored by The Neighborhood. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Chris Bury in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.